Okay, sir. Okay, sorry, there were some glitches uh, initially, but uh, now that we've overcome them, uh, I would like to welcome everyone. Thank you all for joining us for today's webinar. My name is Siddharth ADK and I work as fellow at the Energy and Resources Institute, a leading organization working in the field of energy, environment, and sustainable development over the last four decades. Uh, coastal ecosystems such as mangroves, seagrasses, tidal marshes, and coral reefs, commonly referred to as blue carbon ecosystems, provide numerous benefits and services that contribute to people's ability to mitigate and adapt to the impacts of climate change. Their role in sequestering and storing blue carbon from the atmosphere and oceans is also being recognized by the policymakers today. Understanding this, today's webinar titled Scope and Potential of Coastal Ecosystems will focus on recognition of these coastal ecosystems in climate change mitigation and explore the possibilities of contribution of blue carbon in achieving India's NDC target from our eminent panel, panelists. Uh, just a small announcement before we get started. If you have any questions during the presentation, please type them into the question and answer box uh, on your WebEx control panel and the name of the person the question is addressed to. I'll bring them up at the end of the session during the designated question and answer session. Now, without further ado, I would request Dr. J.V. Sharma to deliver the welcome address. Dr. Sharma is a 1983 batch retired IFS officer from Uttar Pradesh CADA and is presently working as Director, Land Resources Division, Terry. Over to you, sir. Uh, thank you, Siddharth. Uh... Uh, on behalf of the Energy and Resources Institute, uh, New Delhi, and uh, on my own behalf, uh, I would like to welcome the panel, uh, Ministry of Environment, and Forest, and Climate Change, and uh, Dr. A. L. Ramnathan, Professor in School of Environment Science, and Jawaharlal Nehru University. Uh, Mr. Dorothy Herr, Manager Ocean and Climate Change, Global Marine and Polar Program, IUCN. Mr. Sandeep Roy, Advisory Services, Dr. Foundation. Dr. Alok Saxena, former Principal Chief Conservative of Forest, Andaman and Nicobar Island, and uh, retired IFS officer of um, 1983 batch, and Dr. Priyanka. Uh, research associate uh, in the land is first of all i welcome all of all the panelists and the chair ms oma devi uh, why we have thought about uh, having a discussion on uh, blue carbon as uh, re recently we have done one research uh, study on the emission status of the land use in India, and uh, we have husbandry, agriculture, and mining. And you will be surprised to know that the annual emission status is more than a billion. Uh, the, uh, the ton of the equivalent carbon dioxide from these five sectors. And the important uh, uh, in the first, from 1st January 2020, the Paris Agreement is in force. And Revolution. The government of India has also communicated the UNF UNFCCC to achieve uh, uh, Sorry to bother you, Dr. Sharma, but your voice is breaking. I think there's some problem with your connection. So we are not being able to hear you properly. I, I, Siddharth? Uh, so I, your I, voice I, is breaking. No, now no, you I, are. 
Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's okay. I will uh, I will keep continuing. Otherwise, I will be consuming others' time. Sure. So, uh, 2.5 to 3 billion tons of the equivalent carbon dioxide by 2030 from on October 2, 2015 and further ratified on 2000 and 2nd October 2016. What is important that uh, out of three indices, uh, no line has been provided uh, in the NDC of the forestry and we have conducted many uh, consultation national level and the regional level and it has come out with uh, that the baseline should be uh, 2015. If we consider the baseline uh, 2015, then so that um, uh, the target we have to achieve, uh, it is more than 3 billion tons. If we consider over and above of the BAU, uh, the coastal ecosystem and we cannot uh, forget uh, the uh, importance of the coastal ecosystem and the very objective of this uh, web Um, quantify how much target uh, we have enhanced uh, by 2030. We are in uh, and uh, quantification is very, very key and important. And um, uh, as per my informal uh, uh, in, uh, in, in, is also working on uh, uh, the uh, working on the baseline issue and uh, soon it will be decided and quantified uh, the target to be achieved uh, by 2030. Mapping of the gaps in the policies and the programs of the enhancing low carbon. So the, in my uh, personal opinion and whatever I have learned, we have researched that uh, without, we cannot ignore the coastal ecosystem uh, 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 coastal ecosystem and the potential of the coastal ecosystem in the carbon sequestration. And uh, we have uh, uh, the uh, uh, very objective of the today's webinar is to learn, to listen uh, the eminent uh, speakers and also the questions and the knowledge shared by the uh, participants during the webinars in form of the questions so that we will be upgrading ourselves and we are in a process to prepare a policy brief or the policy document uh, for the scope and the potential of the coastal ecosystem in mitigating climate change and also how we can make use of the uh, blue carbon in achieving uh, the uh, indices uh, from forest and tree cover. So with these words, uh, I won't take much time. I again welcome all the panelists, my colleagues, and uh, uh, all the participants uh, for uh, contributing to, uh, towards the today's webinar on a scope and potential of the coastal ecosystem in mitigating climate change. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, I would now request Mrs. B.V. Uma Devi to deliver the keynote address. Mrs. Uma Devi is a 1987 batch IFS officer from Chhattisgarh, Canada, who is presently working as additional secretary, Ministry of Environment, uh, Forests and Climate Change. Over to you, ma'am. So, uh, good morning, uh, everyone. Uh, so, I will now uh, as we all know, uh, I will be speaking in the context of Indian coastal uh, ecosystem. So as we all know, the Indian uh, coastal regions, they consist of, uh, they're very rich in uh, biodiversity and they're diverse. Uh, they are sensitive and very fragile ecosystems. And they have uh, ecosystems such as the coral reef, the mangroves, tidal, mudflats, 
the estuaries, lagoons, marshes, and vegetated uh, wetlands. And many of these uh, coastal ecosystems, uh, I'm sure you're able to hear me. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. So yeah, we are able to hear you. Yes. Systems are known for their, uh, as I said, rich biodiversity, and uh, some coastal wetlands offer unique habitats or seasonal nesting sites for uh, the endangered marine organisms. And the uh, coastal habitats alone account for approximately one third of all the marine biological productivity and the estuarine ecosystem, that is, or uh, the salt marshes, sea grasses, and mangrove forests are among the most uh, uh, productive regions. Coastal ecologically sensitive areas are home to unique flora and fauna. And uh, for example, the coral reefs constitute less than 1% of the ocean floor, but support over 25% uh, of the marine uh, biodiversity. Uh, mangroves and coral reefs aid in controlling coastal erosion and uh, shoreline change, and also serve as a natu uh, natural defense against the fugitive oceans. The coral regions, they provide most of the identified uh, ecosystem services and account for highest value on per hectare basis for any ecosystem. The goods from the eco coastal ecosystem generate provisioning services, which include food, salts, minerals, oil resources, construction materials, and biodiversity, including the genetic stock that has potential for various biotechnological and pharmaceutical applications. Uh, as we all know, India has a coastline of about 7,500 uh, kilometers and an exclusive economic zone spanning of about uh, 2.02 million square kilometers and total wetland cover area is over 40,230 square kilometers along the coastline. Uh, there are about 250 million people, around 14.2% of the country's total population, uh, live within a distance of about uh, 50 kilometers from the coastline. The majority of the growing urban and economic centers of strategic importance are located near the coast, including uh, Chennai, Kolkata, Mumbai, Vishakapatnam, and others. The coast is a high priority area for developmental activities spurred by globalization and increase in anthropogenic uh, activities. Uh, in coastal areas have generated tremendous stress on natural ecosystems and created problems for their proper management. There are uh, also increasing threats, threats to coastal areas due to climate change. One of the effects of uh, climate change is increase in sea level and decrease in phytoplankton population in these coastal ecosystems. The coastal ecosystem, they provide a wide array of goods and services as I mentioned but they can be categorized into provisioning services, regulating services, cultural services, and uh, supporting sub services, which are very important for local communities for their resource-based livelihoods, as well as their, uh, being high importance in maintaining coastal integrity, apart from providing uh, extensive regulating services, including local and global climate change. So it is estimated that around 67% uh, and at least 35% and 29% of the global coverage of mangroves, tidal marshes, and seagrass meadows, respectively, have been lost. If these trends continue at current rates, a further 30 to 40% of the tidal marshes and seagrasses and nearly all unprotected mangroves would be lost in the next 100 years. So conservation of coastal ecosystem by developing community-based management systems has been proven to be very most effective in the long run. Uh, according to many studies. And conservation and uh, restoration of the coastal ecosystem, specifically the sea, trees, uh, sea grass, meadows, mangroves, and tidal salt marshes, are excellent nature-based solutions for climate change mitigation, as they have huge potential to sequester atmospheric carbon. There is a scope to generate renewable energy in these areas too. Wind is one of the major resources of renewable energy available at least uh, at low cost than any other uh, energy options. Wind power is directly proportional to the cube of wind speed. Wind speed in general is more uh, uh, in the offshore region compared to the observed onshore, making it a more reliable source of production of uh, renewable energy. The other opportunity is carbon sequestration by the coastal vegetative ecosystems, namely uh, as we have been talking from since morning namely marshes, mangroves, coral reefs, and sea grasses, which is termed the blue carbon. Uh, 
uh, are well known for the effective high rates of uh, carbon sequestration and the storage of sequestered carbon on long, longer time scales. India has large areas under mangroves, salt marshes, sea grasses, and coral reefs. Protecting and enhancing area of, uh, uh, the area of these ecosystems will increase the extent of long-term blue carbon uh, sequestration. This will contribute towards mitigation of climate change by contributing to reduction of uh, carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. Additionally, the high salinity in many blue carbon systems limits methane production of potent uh, greenhouse gas. Avoiding coastal wetland uh, convert coastal wetland uh, conversion is a very cost-effective climate solution. Many interventions such as establishing protected areas, improved land tenure, and enforcing land use laws can be put in place immediately and yield significant climate benefits. If we stop the loss of uh, coastal wetlands today, we could prevent the release of over uh, 0.45 uh, gigatons of carbon dioxide per year. It is estimated that the average annual carbon sequestration rate for mangroves averages between 6 to 8 mg COT per hectare. These rates are about two to four times greater than the global rates observed in the mature tropical forests. Mangroves provide around 1.6 US dollars, 1.6 billion US dollars each year in ecosystem services, which includes supporting uh, fisheries by providing important uh, spawning uh, grounds for the commercial fish species, filtering pollutants and contaminants from uh, pollutants and contaminants from uh, coastal waters and contributing to healthy coastal marine water quality. The tidal marshes are also a great opportunity that, as they filter pollutants from land runoff and hence help maintain water quality in coastal areas. And uh, it is estimated that average annual carbon sequestration rate uh, for tidal marshes averages again about six to eight mg carbon dioxide per hectare. And these are again uh, are about two to four times greater than those observed in the mature tropical forests. Uh, and uh, the sea grasses also account for less than, although they account for less than 0.2% of the world's oceans, they sequester around 10% of the carbon buried in the ocean sediment annually, around 27.4 tg uh, uh, of carbon per year. Per hectare, sea, uh, sea grasses can store up to twice as much as uh, carbon than uh, the normal terrestrial forest. So there's a great opportunity in. Uh, uh, in investing in, in uh, the, the blue carbon ecosystems. And uh, uh, apart from uh, various initiatives, Government of India has been implementing various programs for conserving and restoration of the coastal ecosystems. Under the integrated coastal uh, management, uh, around 16,000 hectares of mangroves have been planted in the Gulf of Kutch and also a coral transplant um, uh, program of around 1,200 square meters have been taken up in the Gulf of Kutch. And uh, we have also mapped all the ecological sensitive areas of the coastal uh, areas, the coastal zones. And uh, sewage uh, treatment map plants have been established in these uh, areas. And therefore, there's a huge scope for these coastal ecosystems. And uh, I'm sure uh, today with, this, uh, the, with the deliberations in this uh, workshop today, we'll be able to come up with a comprehensive policy uh, to uh, assess the scope and potential of uh, these coastal ecosystems in mitigating climate change. Thank you. Thank, thank you so much, ma'am, uh, for giving your valuable insights on today's topic of discussion. Uh, so, we, so we have the next presentation from Dr. A.L. Ramnathan, but uh, since he's not joined yet, uh, I would now request uh, Ms. Dorothy Hurd, Manager, Oceans and Climate Change, IUC in Global Marine and Polar Program, to present the topic, Nature-Based Solutions in NDC Opportunities and the Role of Blue Carbon in NDC. Can I request you, Dorothy, to make the presentation, please? Yes, terrific. Thank you very much. Okay, I'll try to do this. Let me know it works. I'll go on. 
it. Okay, can you just, yes, looks like it's working. Yeah. Perfect. So, yeah, good morning, everyone. This is Dorothy here from the Global Marine and Polar Program based here in Germany. Thank you very much to Terry and Dr. Sharma for inviting IUCN to participate um, in this panel. And also, thank you very much to Secretary Uma Devi for setting the stage um, so well, also in terms of uh, quantification around some of the services, but also loss rates, etc., around um, these systems. So I would like to start a bit sort of from an um, other background around nature-based solutions before we dive more into UNFCCC processes and some of the more tangible actions uh, potentially ahead of us. Um, the use or the term nature-based solution is very much uh, in high use at the moment. However, it is sometimes used a bit um, differently and on the diff in different contexts. So that's why um, IUCN has been working also through its Commission on Ecosystem Management to help define what nature-based solution is. So here, just for example, as a, a comparison, we have the nature-derived solutions like the renewable energy. We have the nature-inspired solutions, for example, in architectural buildings, etc. And then we have the actual nature-based solutions, which are defined as actions to protect, sustainably manage, or restore natural or modified ecosystems to address societal challenges. And here we obviously talk very much about climate change, However, as we well know, there is a sort of um, very much the package deal around the conservation and restoration of these coastal ecosystems. So just a few weeks ago, um, IUCN actually launched its nature-based solution standards, which is basically a guidance handbook that um, is helping various stakeholders to assess whether um, or how well they are doing towards um, creating, managing, implementing a nature-based solution. It has eight criteria. It is backed up by further scientific evidence and sort of means of verification. And there is a self-assessment tool associated to it. Um, this, it's been high in demand. There's also a lot of training tools being developed to really help the IUCN um, family um, and, and other partners to really sort of um, implement it and use it. So please, if you haven't, seen it yet, I'm happy to share the links afterwards and also, um, you know, really um, help our members um, and, and other partners to, to use it and, and really move um, the NBS forward. Now, switching over to um, blue carbon and indeed um, the use of ecosystem, coastal ecosystem for climate change mitigation. And we've heard about salt marshes, mangroves, seagrasses, uh, and so forth. And just to put it a bit into the context with the UNFCCC head on, that's where I spent um, sort of most of my uh, professional life the last 10 years within the various UNFCCC meetings and experts group, and to sort of put it, put it a little bit into the various buckets. We have obviously the mitigation bucket, where there's activities around emission reductions and avoidance, as well as carbon sequestration. Then we have the technology and the nature-based solution potential. Then um, blue carbon, and again, these coastal wetlands fit uh, into the category of LULUCF, which is land use, land use change and forestry that many are very well aware when they've been talking about um, red plus or tropical or other type of forestry ecosystems and using them for climate change mitigation. There was long a debate whether do coastal ecosystem now fit into this or not, but actually there is a backup from the UNFCCC convention from 1992, the preambular article 41D, which talks about the management of these um, systems of forestry and ocean um, alike. Just maybe here a sort of a side note, because obviously this, the, the webinar is about to explore into potential. And I, again, I've been working on this topic uh, for 10 years, and there's so many reasons why we need to conserve and restore these very valuable coastal ecosystems. But I think it's also very important to underline that um, the, this part or the using the, the mitigation potential is the bigger piece or is, is part of the bigger piece of any climate mitigation action a country or the, the world as a whole needs to take. So, 
while it is an uh, important and for some countries more than others an important uh, solution it's just one in the toolbox and if we really want to tackle climate change we need to divert from fossil fuels we need to invest in renewable energy energy efficiency and so forth so just also to set that um, into perspective um so then, as I said, I spoke from the various UNFCCC buckets. We have the mitigation one, as I said, and for these three systems, mangrove, seagrass, or salt marshes, there is IPCC guidance available for national greenhouse gas inventories. There are various sort of um, expert groups and also, for example, the International Partnership on Blue Carbon that has been doing um, trainings around how to, to use this IPCC guidance. But then, of course, we have the whole adaptation and which to some degree has even a higher importance uh, for many coastal states, low um, low lying islands and so forth. Where again, there are various um, adaptation solutions, engineered, nature based, but then, of course, also some of the hybrids. And even if some of the current um, ecosystems that we talk about are not within the definition or the guidance that the IPCC has, obviously, other like the coral reefs or kelp forest, um, deep sea mountains, etc. All of them play an important role in the carbon cycle. They have an incredible role for climate adaptation. So we should really see them, you know, as a as a whole, really, to how we need to conserve and protect these coastal systems. But then, when it comes about reporting uh, policy setting one might need to sort of differentiate um, a little bit of what is what is possible and feasible. Um, this is just a very quick uh, glance on a guidance document that has been developed by the Blue Carbon Initiative led by Conservation International and other partners, where we looked indeed of giving a bit more hands on practical support to how do I include blue carbon in my national determined contribution, which are obviously, um, as was been said before, setting the emission reduction and adaptation targets um, up to 2030. I hope you can see it on, on the right corner. It's all about this ambition cycle. So the NDCs are not standalone documents. They're linked to national adaptation plans, to broader communication vis-a-vis -vis the UNFCCC. There is a global stock take coming up. So when thinking about these broader um, policy, yeah, policy um, tools, also vis-a-vis -vis the UNFCCC that really the NDC are part of it. And I think this ambition cycle is obviously something very, very important. Um, and this links to, to the next um, slide that I just want to highlight is that, um, yeah, how, how do I deal with, oh, as a country, um, depending on my data availability, now specifically when it comes to, to carbon in coastal ecosystem, because we have an ambition cycle, there are opportunities to really ratchet up um, the information that goes into NDCs, not because you know countries need to ramp up their ambition, but also in terms of how uh, sort of whether it's more qualitative, quantitative data. to provide a bit uh, on a leveled approach, depending on the data availability in the country, what type of information can go um, into the, the 2020 um, NDCs and then maybe, you know, there, um, thereafter. And then, of course, like in the, the IPCC, like a level three would be a bit more like the tier three approach that the IPCC is also providing information or guidance in terms of inventories for greenhouse gas emission reduction. This is a, a, um, a guidance document I quickly wanted to, to uh, raise attention to. It was a sort of an analysis put together after the first round of INDCs and then NDCs um, submitted a few years ago, where we did look at the, yeah, the input uh, of nature-based solutions across the various um, NDCs. So this has coastal element as well as other um, uh, forestry, wetland, um, dryland types, etc. So that is uh, really also trying to highlight what uh, what can be done in the broader sense of uh, informing the current NDC consultations and submission when it comes to nature-based solutions um, at large. So that also has quite a few interesting uh, passages in there. And here's just I'm sure you're very well aware of this, of course. 
um, from the India um, NDC that was submitted a few years ago, which already has quite a few references, primarily on the adaptation side uh, and linking it to coastal zone management, climate change, etc. And I think also here maybe the point sort of, you know, what is maybe another reason to, to include uh, coastal ecosystem management in NDC is obviously also um, finance. It's sort of setting the priorities of a country vis-a-vis -vis its um, mitigation as well as adaptation actions. And when it's linked to GCF proposal, Green Climate Fund or other type of international finance, documents like this are of course setting the scene for others to also investigate sort of like sort of national as well as internationally supported um, activities. This is uh, one of the last slides I wanted to show. Um, and actually this, because I, I think again, Secretary Uma Devi um, hinted towards it, there is a lot of uh, coastal population um, living around the shorelines. There is a need for uh, sustainable development. We often talk about blue economy when it's about uh, the coastal and ocean space. And I think here, um, newer work is, is also looking at how can we combine nature-based solutions for coastal and urban development, because I think there is a, is a huge potential also when you look at the numbers of how many millions and billions is supposed to be spent on infrastructure, that we need to think about ways of how we bring those two together in terms of reducing the negative impacts, but also creating positive um, synergies and not just only in terms of the environmental and social benefits, but really also about the finances. Sort of, and a lot of the work, for example, that uh, looks at um, the multilateral development banks, for example. So, this is giving you a bit of a glimpse of both in terms of what are some of the, the solutions when we really talk NBS and engineering in this sort of hybrid or green gray, whatever we want to call it. But what are, so, um, what are also means of, of bringing the, the finances um, more on track? And I believe there is another presentation on, on this um, later on. And yeah. here, the last slide. Um, so I talked about uh, MDBs, of course, having a role in finance, but then also um, impact investors, uh, which is an, an, a hot topic at the moment. And we see a lot of new funds popping up. Uh, on various occasions, um, IUCN is engaging on the Subnational Climate Fund, um, not uh, within the fund itself, but as the technical assistance. We have we are in the evaluation process of the Green Climate Fund to actually get support for the technical um, assistance. And here it's again what I showed in the slide before, basically putting that into practice and combining nature-based solutions with climate resilient infrastructure. Uh, project. Happy to speak about it more if any questions or share any question. But this is, for example, again, what where IUCN is involved uh, as it with its status as an accredited entity vis a vis the Green Climate One. We have currently uh, 40 um, NOLs, so non objection letters, and very happy to yeah discuss this further. So thank you very much for now. Thank you so much, Dorothy. That was an excellent presentation. Uh, sorry, we are short on time, so I'm quickly skipping uh, uh, back to our uh, uh, presenter. Uh, I would now request uh, Dr. A. L. Ramnathar, Professor, School of Environmental Sciences, Jawaharlal Nehru University, to present the topic Biogeochemical Aspects of Coastal Aquatic Ecosystem and its Role in Mitigation of Climate Change. Over to you, Dr. Ramnathar. Okay. So, uh, screen sharing, how to see the screen sharing? Uh, Veer, can you help him, please? So there's a share content button here. There it uh, is. Uh, click on the share icon button, third icon. It's 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 not uh, it's it's not doing. Allowing. It's not allowing. I think you have to allow me, I think. Sir, rights with view, sharing rights, I given you the sharing rights already. It's yeah. not Click on the share content button. Yeah, third click... only, it is not, uh, it, it's silent, it's not saying. Not right. with you. 
again retrying that again i connect it no, just a minute sir yeah you are now a presenter now only it is yes yes now click on the share content button and no no that is your... still silent it is not uh, operating but it's showing you are the presenter yeah it's showing but it is not allowing me to share the screen okay i will try to send it maybe uh, you can okay. so, so what we can do is sir uh, maybe you can email it to uh, priyanka okay okay and then, then, then uh, i would i would yeah i would uh, we will begin with next presentation oh, maybe okay. after this you can present okay. sir if you don't mind Okay. Okay. No thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, so, uh, because of shortage of time, I would have to request our next presenter, Mr. Sandeep Roy Chaudhary, uh, Director of VNV Advisory Services, to present his topic: Private Sector Finance to Accelerate, accelerate the Restoration of Coastal Ecosystem and Enhancement of Blue Carbon Stocks in India. Uh, can I please request uh, uh, Mr. Sandeep Roy Chaudhary to make his presentation? Hello, Siddharth. Yes, yes, we can hear you, Sandeep. Hi. Excellent. Thanks. Hi. Um, just sharing uh, PPT. Just let. Sure. Hi. Sure. It works. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Let's just hope it works. Yeah. Yeah. It's just yeah. Now it's it's on our screen. Yes. Okay, it was loading so far. Okay, thank you. Thank you for the time. Thank you to Terry for having me. Just want to have a, a well, you know, I think we are, um, I'll take a quick run through. This is a generic um, uh, that we present for any blue carbon kind of engagements. Um, so just to context uh, about VNV, with the company that I work for, we work in various different elements of climate change. A lot of what our work happens with carbon finance. Uh, we have been working for over a decade with carbon finance and trying to tie up development finance to, to uh, climate uh, private sector finance. So we work in areas of clean cooking, forestry, sustainable agriculture. So the big thematic areas for us are actually forestry and agriculture as of now. We work across South Asia in about nine countries. And we work with about 400,000 hectares and the land use in forestry, which is quite relevant to the discussion that we are having now. Um, so our work with Blue Carbon, uh, we have been working with carbon finance. Typically, we, we did the rounds of private sector finance for Blue Carbon. Um, but um, And, you know, Dorothy mentioned a lot about the potential of Blue Carbon. And I think she set the context for the financing arrangement of Blue Carbon as well. But a lot of our work has been with carbon finance. We've been working in different countries like Bangladesh, Myanmar, Philippines, Indonesia, um, and now India as well. Um, on the carbon finance side, we had a VCS project that is under VERA these days that was registered um, a couple of years back. And we very recently have a program of activity, the first, I would assume, for blue carbon uh, for Asia that was registered under the UNFCCC days back. So uh, it's quite an ambitious program uh, that we are launching for Asia and Blue Carbon. Um, and that spent a lot of time and investments into our which are important for us. Just moving on, uh, we're also uh, launching this fund in Singapore, which is basically going to look at Asia and Africa uh, for a revolving fund. Um, this is with a group of impact investors, as Dorothy mentioned, that's become quite the theme now, nature-based solutions, but we've been um, trying to see how we could get conventional finance to complement climate finance. And trying to bridge that gap is where this revolving fund comes in. Because with Blue Carbon, what we've seen is, and, and it, it is a very effective tool, um, you know, as much as we, we, we go with the funding mechanism from the mitigation side or the sequestration side, uh, a lot of the work is actually adaptation. So if you look at it, the amount of money that will be spent on the mitigation actually saves a lot of the adaptation side in years to come because climate 
as we know, we need to achieve scale and achieve scale quickly. So we came up with this concept of basically impact investors getting a decent rate of return, as well as carbon off takers from the private sector being able to contribute to different NDCs, as well as, you know, uh, have more than 80% of their carbon offset revenues go back to planting more trees. So the idea here is that how uh, finance can revolve itself. And we're looking at starting with about 10 million trees, which quickly accelerates to over 140, 150 million trees. Uh, that's the idea of this product. And we're starting, uh, we're launching this as a 6 million euro fund in Singapore in October, uh, which will then work with developers across these regions, that's Asia and Africa, and support NGOs, implementation partners, smaller grassroots organizations to quickly take up mangrove reforestation as well as restoration. There are three thematic areas to our work. Um, basically, we believe that just planting trees isn't enough. There has to be an ecosystem-based uh, model which would typically mean that we're looking at three uh, different facets. We're looking at conservation, we're looking at reforestation, as well as we're looking at seagrass management. Because for us, it needs to be an entire thing because we can plant all we want, but if you don't create conservation buffers around it, we will have a problem with permanence. And that's something that if you look at private sector money going into blue carbon, permanence is the biggest issue. And I'll come to that later in terms of how we do it in our work or how we've been doing it since 2015. Just a quick thing on what is carbon finance? Why am I spending so much time on carbon finance? This is a big, big push on from private sector finance towards carbon finance. And that's why I'm, I am taking that theme out. Obviously, this is not the only form of carbon uh, private sector finance, but it is quite an important element of it, um, in, in, especially in these days when countries have to meet NDCs and corporates have to meet net zero targets, so to speak. Um, just a bit on the Paris Agreement, it recognizes, I mean, uh, a lot of the people in this panel, um, as well as in, in this event, are very well conversant with what NDCs are and Paris Agreement, I would assume. Blue carbon fits in really well, because like I mentioned right at the top, it is actually more about adaptation and saving adaptation costs for 40 years later or 20 years later. Actually, why 20 years later? Five years later, is we're looking at depleting uh, land resources every day that we speak, vulnerable communities, very high population areas. We work in Bangladesh, for example, you know, in each square kilometer, that kind of density is, is massively vulnerable uh, to, to climate and different kinds of cyclones that come in, even in parts of Philippines, et cetera. Um, Blue carbon and emerging aspects in the carbon markets, it has been for a while. Uh, we identified this, I think, about six years back where we decided to start working on this slowly and, and make it more mainstream and try and, you know, make it into financing and how it could possibly come into picture. Um, I wouldn't want to spend too much time on this slide. Um, I think that has been mentioned um, even by the secretary and Dorothy to some extent in, in terms of what the problem is. We're losing mangroves, we're losing tidal marshes, we're losing seagrass meadows, this is no secret. Uh, you know, and, and, and this, we really need to, to work at this uh, on a war path to make sure that it, it works on, um, you know. Like I said, I mean, climate change is something that we are dealing with every day um, and for us, as much as we like grassroots work, if it's not, if if our if the work that we do, uh, that's all of us, all stakeholders, it's not done on scale, we're really wasting time here because we need to achieve scale and achieve scale very very quickly. So just a slide on um, you know what has been lost globally, you know, and what blue carbon gives in terms of financial incentives. I mean, I'm specifically talking about carbon finance. We've seen that we achieve a sequestration rate of around 550 to about 650, ranging to about 850 tons per hectare for 10 years. That's a usual financing uh, period for any project. So we look at these kind of numbers and that work backwards towards how we could possibly uh, you know, achieve mitigation finance. Um, so this is uh, in terms of what we do with the carbon sequestration part. Obviously, this has a lot of science behind it. 
Earlier, it used to be above ground biomass. Now, of course, there's a soil carbon element to it that can be added into the sequestration, which kind of makes it more interesting to fund as well. Ecological benefits, I don't need to, I don't think we need to spend too much time on this, uh, but the ecosystem health is, is so important. And this is where mangroves come in and the whole coastal forestry part. And that is something that we need to be, um, I, I, I think a lot of participants on this call are already aware of it. Flood control, groundwater, water, actually water is quite the thematic area for us. And we need to be, um, you know, uh, because of also the communities living around those areas. So we are also trying in terms of our financing mechanisms, um, trying to build in elements of, you know, uh, municipal bonds, for example, for coastal municipalities, uh, green bonds that could potentially look at how it can complement carbon finance. Uh, socioeconomic activities that need to be done on coastal areas. I mean, you know, in terms of fisheries, so we look at sustainable supply chain for fisheries. We look at hatcheries, et cetera, et cetera, as a, an add-on social benefit to the ecological benefit, because both are not mutually exclusive of each other. Which brings me to my next slide, which is basically about the socioeconomic part. Um, very important. Like I said, for our funding mechanisms, these are long-term perspectives. These are long-term uh, engagements. We need permanence of the forests, impossible unless the people are on board. We use the communities to not only reforest, conserve, but, but you have to work with alternative livelihoods. Otherwise, these forests are not going to be permanent as, as much as scientifically we can try and prove it. So there's a huge social element to it. And, uh, and that is inbuilt into a lot of the financing mechanisms that we talk about. Because I think just the reforestation and the environment part, I mean, and the forestry part of it is probably just about 30 to 40 percent of what we need to spend as resources. The rest of it is just a social um, So, you know, uh, a lot of the, uh, I'm just going to talk through these while you can read a bit of uh, on, on the uh, slides. But Employment opportunities, obviously sustainable fisheries is one example of it. There are other elements you can inbuilt microfinance, um, other based gender based finance. A lot of the areas that we've worked in, we've seen that financial inclusion is was absent there completely. So there could be an element of how the traditional banking system can also move in and try and complement some of the financing arrangements that are coming from other private sector players. So it's, it has to be a complementary angle. I would assume that a lot of the private sector financing would be blended. Um, right now we are blending for, you know, uh, green bonds with uh, carbon finance, for example, and that could be blended with microfinance and it could be a blended probably with traditional financial um, uh, structures as well. Obviously there has to be an incentive for conservation for um, for the mangroves or, um, you know, I'm, I'm I'm mentioning mangroves again and again, but I don't mean that that's the only ecosystem out there. Uh, but there has to be a financial incentive, and how that financial incentive could be built into these products, so to speak, of areas and in scale, is is very important. And community buy-in, like I said, everything has to be driven community, you know, by them for them, kind of a, a of a, of an arrangement. Income generated. I'm spending a lot more time on the socioeconomic part because for us, that's the most important part. Because without that, these forests, for example, can do whatever we want. It's 50. Um, so this, these are the examples that we, 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 we work very hard on, on trying to identify what could be the gaps in terms of, you know, addressing the actual uh, fishery problem. For example, solar dryers. Crab fattening uh, activities, hatcheries, tying that supply chain down to you know luxury resorts around the area, trying to see how we could possibly have the food security element also tied in. You know, so it has to be a whole scale kind of an ecosystem uh, uh, project or program. Otherwise, there's no way to reach scale to really fund it. Um, just a bit about the additional revenue. I did mention uh, microfinance and so on and so forth. These are various levels. Okay, that's the first thing you need to look at when doing a baseline study is not how much degradation has happened is why the degradation has happened and you know and that's something that we are always very cognizant of when we move into different kinds of programs first thing is we try and identify the drivers for the degradation and then work backwards from there because just planting and restoring forest is the easier part really um 
Of course, there are other forms of private sector finance for coastal ecosystems. We've seen that we've worked. I mean, UNDP runs a facility for for coastal reef insurance, for example. There are different payment for ecosystem services, as as Dorothy mentioned. They run a facility as well, uh, which which works very closely on these elements. Um, but the idea is, I think, all of these to work together um, to a large extent. Though I have to admit that the marine ecosystem insurance hasn't done very well, uh, because I think the target audience was was basically private sector who depend on coastal ecosystems. But I think if that's modeled a little better, and maybe this panel could throw more light on it, or uh, maybe it's a takeaway for later. I, I, I did see this as something that's quite had potential about seven years back, but it hasn't translated on the ground. But we would have to somehow inbuilt uh, sovereign insurance mechanisms with coastal ecosystems. And I think that could be very uh, crucial um, in, in trying to accelerate the funding. Because as much as we like it, the NDCs are there. We cannot expect all the governments to deliver on their NDCs on their own. Private sector of each country, of each region has to pitch in and pitch in in ways that make sense. It's not just about pitching in for 100% of the cost. We possibly don't need that. You know, so we need basic blended elements that can come together. And there could be different actors, players who could fit in to as plug in fit in. See the light of day well for a long period of time. If you're looking at presentation, you have to look at this for a hundred year period. And that's where I would assume that uh, we need to look at. Of course, this goes without saying, um, there are various SDGs trackers that we have internally as well, but uh, in, in terms of, we all know man, uh, blue carbon ticks off SDGs, but exactly which and how much of the SDG that you have impacted. And we believe that, you know, blue carbon fits in really well. And we've worked in climate for a while now. We understand that various benefits of different kinds of climate programs being blue carbon is really top of that. Uh, heap, if I may. Um, as, as Dorothy mentioned, there is no one solution for all of it. I think we need to really get on, on the road with terms of uh, different kinds of elements, sequestration, removals, avoidance, the whole works. But I would still peg ecosystem conservation uh, right high up in the uh, pecking order. So with that, um, I'm done with my presentation. Happy to take questions later. Um, I think I've just gone over time a little bit. Sorry for that. Uh -huh. But <laughs> Thanks um, for the time. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for your elaborate presentation. We'll do, we'll, we will take the question and answers later. Uh, uh, I would now request Dr. A.L. Ramnathan to make his presentation. Uh, I think Dr. Ramnathan has shared his presentation with us. Priyanka, can you please uh, upload his presentation? Or is it going to take time? Priyanka, can you please upload uh, Dr. Ramnath's presentation? She's there. Yeah, I think she's uploaded, sir. Yeah, okay. Yes, can you see it, sir? Yeah. It's yeah. there on your screen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Can can so, can I please request you to uh, yeah, proceed? Yeah. 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 Thank you. So. Good evening and good afternoon to all of you. Thank you for Terry and the director for giving me this chance and for the panelists who are expertise in this coastal and audience. So uh, I've been working on the mangroves uh, and the coastal groundwaters for over uh, uh, two decades. And uh, we have uh, identified that some of the mangroves, how much stops are there in the uh, below and above ground mass, how they sequester the carbon. I'll just give the overall view. So you can see from this diagram that uh, how much percentage of uh, uh, carbon is released from the anthropogenic activities compared to that of the natural. So this is the culprit. Next, uh, next slide. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Priyanka, please move next slide, please. Yeah. Next slide, please. Yeah. So. Uh, 
you press it and uh, this is the we are talking about the blue carbon good carbon and the bad carbon that is uh, you keep on pressing that and uh, and this is the terrestrial biota the green carbon and the black carbon and then the blue carbon we are having the two things one is the coastal carbon that is uh, very important for us especially the salt marshes mangroves and sea grasses so we have the large coastal ecosystem and then the uh, carbon moves in the coastal system it sequesters the carbon from the atmosphere and also emitted by the respirations and then we have the autochthonous and allotonous uh, that is one is the uh, carbon uh, entered to the system from the way away in the via runoff from the streams and the rivers so we are working on these two things one is the allotonous carbon and the autochthonous carbon most of the sequestered carbon is stored in the soil uh, that is what even uh, i will show you some records of 2000 years uh, back also we got the record that how much is sequestered in the region and the next this is the intertidal zone the very important for the uh, blue carbon next next priyanka can she move or hello i think sir the slides are moving slowly uh rather at our end this, we can see a different slide but while uploading it it's coming slowly okay i think so i will i will close my audio maybe uh, video okay so yeah you can project the full screen maybe yeah so uh, I think people talked about the blue carbon and how it is because yeah. the mangroves are one of the important uh, one, which is long term uh, climate mitigation is uh, comes through only the coastal ecosystems and it stores half of the our uh, tidal with these two to get together compared to the ocean and marine environment. They store the 50% of the uh, blue carbon in the region. And uh, next. Next. Maybe I think uh, our net is no, or and uh, yeah, you can put uh, this is the distribution of the seagrass, salt marshes, and mangroves. If you see that the that is the mangroves are the maximum, followed by that of the uh, salt marshes, and then the seagrasses they store the mangroves. And the one example I would show the seagrass, which is a, a flowering plant with deep rooters that found in the meadows along the shore of the continents. And then they, although they occupy 0.2% of the world oceans, they sequestered 10% of the carbon buried in the ocean city. So the, the distribution and size is not important. Only the maximum amount of the sequestration is done by this uh, ecosystem is very important. So this is the mangroves because uh, very important because uh, it is having the above below ground mass plus liters because uh, it is uh, growing in the uh, brackish water and it is taking the fresh water and releasing the salt water. And this one, I have trapping efficiency because it is, uh, I will call it as a small bowl in front of the big bowl. So it stores the carbon and also the pollutants before entering to the open ocean. And then it receives from this uh, autotonus and allotonus from the rivers and as well as from the benthic organisms. Next, it is having a lot of uh, organisms which are sensitive to the global uh, next. Yeah, next slide. So, uh, various wetlands, coastal and estuarine wetlands are one of the highest activities. India, we are having the uh, estuarine wetlands and coastal wetlands and also the marine wetlands uh, of the mangroves, different types of lagoonal and other things. And then seagrass also we have along the southern regions uh, and it is uh, uh, covering around that uh, 77 to 60,000 kilometers square and mangroves 1,67 kilometers square. And then the peat also is there in the coastal regions and floodplains, which is also now uh, more important for sequestering the carbon. Next. So the key access is that uh, uh, the, when you uh, destroy the mangroves or the degrade the mangroves or the coastal ecosystem, and then uh, the anaxonic condition will be the axic conditions, and then methane will contribute around 38 or 34 times of the global warming. And then the methane emission is, uh, is uh, uh, releases more uh, uh, of this uh, greenhouse gas and uh, generally in the saline environment because of the sulfate and salt water and brackish systems and anoxidic condition the methane emission is suppressed 
but when you make it to the fresh water systems that it releases more so that is why very important to conserve the mangroves and sequester the carbon and then the and it is a sink uh, at least long term sink is there in the mangrove ecosystems and the coastal ecosystems next if you see the uh, degradation of these wetlands if you see that one inland wetlands are declining more rapidly compared to the, the coastal wetlands at least uh, that is the only uh, uh, better thing that happens. Uh, the coastal ecosystem still is not that much deteriorated compared to that of the inland ecosystem. And the intertidal zones, because it happens in the intertidal zones, uh, where the, it is having the harsh conditions exist due to the high tide and the low tide and anoxoning toxic conditions. Uh, suddenly, there is a change in the temperature and uh, due to the extreme weather conditions as well as climate change. So organisms, enzymes and protein activities uh, slatters considerably here and affect their growth as well. As. So the wetlands surface is only 5 to 8 percent of the total landmass, but uh, their soil holds 35 percent uh, uh, estimated of the 1500 gigatons of organic carbon in the stored in the oil. In the soil. So it stores about uh, 40 percent of the coal approximately uh, uh, what we are exploiting in the mangrove and the coastal ecosystem. Next. So I uh, just that's what I told. There is a study in the 2016 shows that organic soil in the mangroves, uh, nearly 2,000 years old in the harbor, average the ground content uh, of uh, that they stored around 1,200 metric tons of carbon per hectare. So that much amount of carbon can be stored for a long term in the mangrove ecosystem. So we have to conserve these mangroves uh, in the region. Next. Next. Uh, so uh, the the culprits are those things uh, that is uh, aquaculture and especially in the southeastern coast earlier the uh, shrimp and aquaculture farms are deteriorated now we have uh, stopped those things we are improving the mangrove ecosystem and even regeneration is happening in some places of the mangroves in the region so we lost around 35% uh, uh, of the total area of mangroves uh, cleared in the regions so they are having a lot of uh, uh, economy as well as the uh, uh, in the region. And then especially this uh, Malaysia, Indonesia and the uh, uh, Southeast Asian countries, a lot of uh, degradation of this mangrove happens and releases a lot of methane uh, greenhouse gases into the atmosphere. Next. So this is how this blue carbon storage in the coastal mangroves uh, and then the salt marshes gases and then the kelp forests, that is the gain seaweeds uh, in this region. They store a lot of uh, uh, blue carbon in these regions and uh, and they are being lost one to 2% per year. So that is what the concern is there uh, to uh, conserve these uh, uh, man, uh, coastal ecosystem in the region. Next. So I told you that uh, this is the study we have been doing it and uh, that paper is uh, recently come out. And then we have the sedimentary carbon, important. Once we uh, remove the mangroves, the erosion will uh, take out these sediments and uh, and all this uh, oxygen environment will come and then the CO2 and the methane will be emitted in this region. So the living biomass is storing only the only the 30 percent and 70 percent is storing in the uh, dead by a sedimentary carbon in the region. So it is very important to reduce the erosions and expose the sediments to the oxy conditions in the regions. Next. So this is the uh, that we are talking about that uh, sequestration, storage, and release. It releases slowly during the high tide, low tide. When it is become highly uh, extreme conditions happens, or deforestation is taking place, then more CO2 will be emitted from these regions. Next. So uh, you can see from this that uh, above ground mass and the uh, below ground mass. Below ground mass is having the maximum amount of uh, carbon storage. That studied in this region. Next, the globally, if you see that one, so it is important to conserve the soil carbon in the uh, mangrove ecosystems. Next, so you see that uh, how much deal of blue carbon in the carbon ecosystems, the tropical forest you see, and the boreal forest and temperate forest. There is you see the mangroves. Uh, it is uh, ten times that of this uh, tropical forest, and seagrass is around. Uh, uh, eight per, uh, more than eight, eight times, uh, and the uh, salt marsh also ten times in this region. So, so the it shows the importance of the coastal ecosystems uh, for the climate mitigation measures in the future to store the blue carbon. Next. So this is again the same thing that uh, they store these things in the soil organic carbon, 
and the living biomass. You can see the comparison between this forest as well as the mangroves coastal ecosystems. They stored the maximum in the uh, soil organic carbon. Next. Next. Maybe my internet is slow. So if you see that marine mangroves and the oceanic mangroves. So the oceanic are made lagoonal type ones, which is having less organic carbon stored in that one compared to the estuarine mangroves. So the the inter uh, the intertidal zones between the reef and the estuaries mangroves and the open seas are more important for conserving the uh, storing the blue carbon in the region compared to that of the open ocean mangroves. Next. I think our internet is. Dr. Ramnathan, yeah. Sorry to bother you, but I think we're running a bit late. Can I please request yeah, you to conclude to in the next three over. minutes? Yeah, yeah, that's uh, going to be over. Okay. Matching this oh, thing, thing that every year the coastal wetlands seek uh, 1 billion barrels of oil equivalent to that one. 726 of coal emissions are offset by one hectare of mangroves. So it's better to conserve the mangroves. And the coastal wetlands are the only habitat that can continuously sequester on a million of years. And then one hectare of seagrass can store uh, two, two times of the uh, two into two x times of the carbon. So the versatile wetlands are small but mighty, also covers less than one percent of the ocean. They store 50 percent of the seabed carbon reserves. So this shows the importance of the coastal ecosystem. Next. Okay, I think uh, so. If the time is uh, and also net is slow, I think uh, yeah. This is the, basically I want to tell that that uh, the not only the living uh, region. Okay, next next slide. You can go to the next slide. This is already I talked about. So the benefits you can see that one. How much is the millions yeah. and millions of rupees? Next. Next. This is how this conversion to pastures. Back set, we go to the back. This is how the conversion to pasture convert to stream forest. So the conversion to pasture is uh, relatively less uh, destroying the mangrove, the carbon sequestration compared to the stream. The main culprit of uh, releasing more CO2 in the regions, uh, destroying the coastal ecosystem. Next. So these are the some of the uh, uh, degradations. Next. Uh, next. Okay, so this is the pathway. Last slide, you go to the last slide. This is everybody knows. No, no, one, one before. Ah, this is the what we to approach is that uh, 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 protecting the, and restoring the wetlands of climate mitigation, adopting the reflects the key TNF for the Ramsar strategy plan and represent the progress towards meeting the sustainable development goals in the Paris Agreement on climate change. So, efforts to have to promote the promote or protect and restore the wetlands. And as per the national determined contributions, India's intended national determined contribution number five, enhancing the forest carbon sinks. So I think we are trying to create the additional carbon sinks of 2.5 to 3 billion tons of CO2 equivalent through additional forest and recover by 2020. So the, we are uh, we are already committed to that. I hope that is uh, restoration of these coastal mangrove ecosystems will be done or the coastal uh, aquatic ecosystem by the government of India to mitigate the uh, uh, CO2 emissions and to store the blue carbon. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Ramnathan. Uh, so, without wasting any time, I would now yeah. request yeah. Uh, Dr. Naveen Nambutri, Director yeah. from uh, Dakshin Foundation, to present the topic Role of Coastal Ecosystems like Sandy Beaches and Sand Dunes and how they can contribute to climate change mitigation. Uh, Dr. Naveen, can I please request you to? Yeah. Sorry, I'm yes, sir, you're audible, but your voice is breaking a bit. 
Yeah, I need to in that my connectivity here is a little on the poor side, but I'll put a hand cover. Is it audible? Yes, sir. You are audible? We can't share the uh, see the screen yet. Yeah, it's why he's starting to share content. I think uh, your bandwidth is too slow. That's why it was. Okay. Okay, about that. Me to it. Yes, Siddharth. Uh, my suggestion that send uh, it uh, to the, us uh, the presentation, and meanwhile you can request Dr. Anup Saxena, and uh, we can uh, upload here in our site, as we did in case of Mr. Dr. Ramnath. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah, I think the presentation is there on the screen. Yeah, yeah, maybe, yeah. Maybe you can present now, Doctor. Okay, can you see it on the screen? It is very now. slow. I think not the now. Uh, not now. Not now. Okay, I'll, I'll try. Earlier, we it. could see it. Yeah, maybe sir, you can present it this way only because if you full screen, sometimes the slide they just freeze. So I think oh, okay. uh, this is also fine. What is there on our screen? Sure. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much. Yeah. Opportunity, and I'm and um, I'll probably switch on the video towards the end if, if the bandwidth allows. But right now, I'm just going to go ahead only with the audio. So yes, thanks for this opportunity and. Uh, the topic seems to have been covered extensively by speakers who are going to come and talk about, uh, you know, their own topics later on. I think between all of them, most coastal ecosystems and services seem to be covered. What I'm going to try and focus on is on the sandy beaches and sand dunes, some of the most overlooked kind of uh, ecosystems in 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 the coastal systems. It, it, it's just been there or registered or you know gotten the kind of attention that many other ecosystems say such as seagrass, salt marshes, or mangroves have attained. So quite often they don't kind of uh, you know uh, they're not kind of pictured in many of the conversations when it comes to our, our discussions around uh, coastal planning. So without much ado, I'll begin my talk. And uh, I, I I think to think of you know, not as separate systems that is, you know, seagrass ecosystem separately, coral reefs separately, mango separately, but, you know, the both the land and the sea are very strongly interconnected and perspective, a lot of the, you know, a lot of the sand that is necessary for these systems to kind of thrive in comes from, you know, uh, uh, upstream sources from the land. And this is Critical because in that you do let's say for instance a, a major dam upstream can choke you know the that come downstream uh, in terms of nutrient sort of you know uh, even carbon across these systems there's a lot of interconnectedness and once the sand enters from the land into the sea uh, the main the main process by which they're carried across the the you know the shoreline is through these currents called longshore currents, and particularly on the east coast of India, our longshore currents are extremely strong. They they move from. I'm talking about I mean I'm talking about the basic processes because these are very critical coastal planning, particularly uh, you know shoreline planning and you know. Given that, as she was uh, mentioning, these are becoming the next, uh, you know, frontiers for development, and it's really critical that we take these into consideration. And uh, what 
happens after the sand arrives on the beach is that it's the wind that takes over and kind of moves it around the you know in 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 into further you know in into the hinterlands and quite often these vegetation that one finds on the you know not given any particular attention are the ones that are very critical in trapping these sand particles and helping binding them together and and kind of you know helping the formation of beaches as well as sand dunes kind of, you know overview of how it looks the whole process looks from the see the you know the sea brings and the wind blows it and then all the other vegetation traps it and slowly you get dune formations dunes systems that take many years to form they're not you know they don't form overnight so it's really uh, many of the sand dunes that we see currently in india whatever is left of it is primarily you know quite significantly old dunes and human perspective we've been using this uh, the the dune spaces and the four dunes and the beach spaces for multiple purposes from you know docking your boats to drying fish to net mending to people's settlements as well a lot of this is happens in that coastal space in that tiny narrow belt the beaches that's where most of these activities are kind of centered and this has uh when it comes to your know, spatial planning as well, because a lot of spaces are generally considered to be, uh, you know, common or, or land that is available for you. But there are, uh, you know, extensive histories of customary use, traditional use of these uh, spaces for multiple purposes by the local fishing communities. And they form integral part, even from medicines and other things, the dune systems and dune vegetation are critical part. Uh, yeah, these are that's a picture of you know settlements on top of sand dunes, and a lot of this case started getting a lot of the atten lot of attention primarily after the tsunami, and I'll talk about that a little later. But they're also very critical. What you see here, this the sea, the ocean on the corner, and then there is the uh, you know just behind the dunes, right next to the coastline, is paddy farming and you know and very rich sources of fresh water as one of the services that these ecosystems provide is also being excellent sinks for fresh water so whenever there's a rain sand is the best best absorbent and retainer of uh fresh water so you really you know a, a very thin layer of fresh water lens in coastal areas in areas where there are sand dunes you know excellent sand dune vegetations uh or sand dune systems surviving and the beach space as well, you know, there are ex different kinds of trees that are specialized to grow in these areas, like the little forests and, and uh, you know, and other kinds of life uh, plant forms and, and, and in as well. There are multiple, you know, kind of flora fauna that have adapted to these systems. Uh, it's also a space for, you know, for biologically uh, a species that are of high conservation in India, which is probably one of the critical, uh, you know, sites for species like sea turtles who use these spaces for, you know, for for their nesting and and purposes. And uh, and and in a way, it has drawn a lot of attention to the coast beach spaces and given it some form of protection thanks to the you know the presence of these uh, species with high conservation value. Uh, I'm also just quickly going to talk about some of the threats and challenges that some of these systems face and then get to, you know, their significance. Climate. Change. Yeah, we've talked about this in previous as well is that, you know, we have this extensive huge opportunities for, you know, for coastal development but what is also critical to understand is a lot of these coastlines are eroding and continue to increase as well 33 percentage of india's coastline has eroded and there is another 29 percentage that seems to have accreted as well grown as well so understanding these uh dynamics is really critical and and critical in coastal planning sorry and uh 
what we also see is uh, we do tend to get into you know these quick fix solutions to be uh, you know honestly exacerbating the problem again I'll, I'll, I'll talk about that in, in detail later but we did talk about you know native based solutions and and that is something that I'd like to also kind of on towards the end and if one way to look at how these coastal systems how dynamic these systems are this is uh, four month kind of a within a within a beach space this is in uh, you know north of Pondicherry Tamil Nadu border uh, this is pictures from the exact same spot over you know over a four month period and as you can see there are there's clearly extensive loss of, of the beach in a shop. Tend to come back as well. Sometimes they do come back, but quite often once it eroded, it's the beaches to kind of come back, uh, particularly if they're quite far away from say deltas or, you know, from terrestrial or not. And our solutions have quite often been to look at these hard engineering options. And, and uh, well, I come from Kerala and here there's massive concern not just on the coastlines with erosion and and extensive seawalls and uh, you know seawalls and hard engineering options being explored but the raw materials come from you know the the uh, extreme biodiverse areas but also getting extremely uh you know impact granite stones to be put in, in seawall, I mean, to build seawall across the coastline. So this is not just a problem for the coast, but also has kind of, uh, you know, extended itself to the uh, uh, to areas of high biological concerns in, in, in the And uh, looking at, so coming to some of the contributions that some of these systems have towards uh, in a in, change perspective a lot of uh it, like i said because they have it quite often been overlooked there's not enough studies on their potential to be uh you know uh, to be sequestered urban i found one study uh google a very brief search one study that i could find which showed the kind of uh you know sequestering ability of dune systems in comparison to other other systems so from a sequestering point of view, they're not probably the best performer in comparison to a coastal system. But what very critical is from our direct impacts of climate change, like you know, extremely high storm surges and, and the increasing frequency of storm surges, particularly on the west coast, east coast of India, which faces probably in you know, one of the most vulnerable coastal regions. It's really critical to uh, solutions that are not, uh, you know, short term and, and short sighted, but but we need to look. And these sand dunes have demonstrably well in, in times of some other, you know, cyclones in many other parts of India. Uh, one initiative that has been extensively taken up construction of seawalls and hard op engineering options. There have been other uh, initiatives like shelter wells, cashewina plantations that have been explored to strengthen the systems. But uh, there is also enough evidence to show that cashewina uh, does have impacts on the uh, you know coastal systems as well. They, their ability to bind soil isn't as fantastic of the other native species such as uh you know the native weed varieties as also as you know the central top picture is sand spine effect something that can uh you know that grows extensively in dune systems in india and excellent sand binders the top right corner is another species which is i then larger varieties of trees like uh the palmyra tree on the on the bottom these are trees that are also critical has become like critical part of coastal communities as well. There are multiple purposes. And it's- Sorry to bother you, uh, Dr. Uh, uh, 
but can you please conclude in next two minutes? Sorry, we are a little short on time. Yeah. Right, so I'm done. Okay. Thank, yeah, you. thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. So, uh, yeah, so there are, uh, you know, uh, extensive and in many parts of the world, there are community based, uh, you know, coastal being undertaken, which quite often is popular because it's easy to club with recreational activities and, and easy to mobilize people, you know, put in efforts to, to restore coastal systems. And uh, just wanted to end a small example from uh, one small village in South uh, Tamil Nadu. It's in close to Velankani, uh, the city of Velankani. It's called South, South Poige. And it's a they're not fisher in an agrarian community. And what they've done is over, a, uh, over the 30, 40 years, because they wanted to do paddy farming and other kinds of agriculture, we started using the palm tree leaves and as binders of, of sand to, to block the sand trans, uh, transfer. In. And then, which is the center right picture, is, is a sand dune with the uh, you know, vegetation on the right side and the and the sea on the left. As you can see in the bottom left, corner, what it has done to the to the community is that the the fresh uh, lens in that area is is quite incredibly at, at very very shallow depths. You get you know extensive fresh water used for their agricultural practices. There's enough evidence to also show that you know. It's possible to to kind of strengthen some of these coastal systems, and there are exist practices in place. And this is just one example. There are many such examples in different parts of, uh, particularly along the east coast of India, where communities face ex you know huge threats from the uh, you know from the uh, from and storm surges and all of that. So many of these indigenously developed kind of systems are there. Top corner is just one. I'll just picture that was a uh, part of a study after the tsunami which shows even in special wells and vegetation had been tied out uh, the influx of the waves during the tsunami was extremely high but in areas where there were extensive sand dune vegetation and sand dune systems the the impact on the land was you know on the on the coastal system. so and and this is not just this is just one example from a Coastline, but there are multiple other sites where it's been shown that areas that were protected by dunes were so much, much better than even probably mangrove systems and delta vegetations and other. But thank you. On that note, I'll, I'll wrap up for now and happy to take questions. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Naveen. Uh, I would uh, now request Dr. Alok Saxena, former PCCF, Andaman and Nicobar Islands, to present the topic role of coastal. Sorry, uh, he doesn't have a presentation. So, sir, I would request you to speak uh, on your topic, please. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Siddharth. I think I am audible. Yes. Am sir. I audible? Yes, sir. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Here. Uh, Siddharth also told I don't have any presentation to make, and I will simply speak on. And cover a little bit on a subject matter of debate whether coral reefs are a source of carbon or sink. I am sure that participants in this webinar are all aware of what coral reefs are, what are their ecological and economic importance. Our chairperson has already covered a little bit on, on the importance of coral reefs. As you understand, Coral reefs are one of the most important marine ecosystems and are very sensitive to climate change. Though they are not considered to play a significant role in net carbon dioxide removal from environment, yet we cannot ignore them when we talk of climate change adaptation strategies. Uh, you know, in tropical coral reef, they cover an area of over 2,84,000 square kilometers. And when it comes to India, 
it covers about 5790 square kilometers which constitute around 2% of free area of the world in india there are four major and islands lakshadweep gulf of mannar in tamil nadu and gulf of kutch in uh, gujarat some other areas also where coral reefs are found like tarkarli in malwan district of maharashtra and some places are found in uh, goa Karnataka, Kerala, and Odisha also. Uh, if we see the India is very rich in coral reef species. If I talk about Andaman and Nicobar Islands, by the year 2017, ZSI, Zoological Survey of India, they identified 586 species of coral corals. Uh, when it comes to types, most of the reefs in India are reefs is only a reef which is on the western side of Andaman Nicobar Islands. Reefs of they are at all in nature. Uh, you are aware of the importance of uh, coral reefs. They harbor a variety of marine life. They are breeding ground and nursery to a variety of marine fishes and invertebrates. They protect our shoreline from erosion and act as a shield against storms and cyclones. Uh, the ecosystem services provided by coral reef systems are worth over uh, $100 million annually. And these, these services include coastline protection, tourism, food and medical activities. Uh, this was already pointed out by our chairperson. We all understand that coral reefs are under severe threats from both anthropogenic and natural disturbances. Natural disturbances include storm, cyclone, uh, coral diseases, and also by predator. There are variety of anthropogenic uh, activities that affect coral reefs. Uh, pressure from the growing human population, coastal development, overfishing, land based pollution, etc. These are, these are human based activities. And climate change, like global warming, sea level temperature increase sea level increase and ocean acidification. These are all uh, active which, which impact coral leaves. Of impact of climate change and high carbon emission, we find that they can affect coral leaves in a number of ways. Uh, mass bleaching of corals because of increase in ocean temperature. Uh, you must be aware that uh, corals have a symbiotic relationship with an algae called zooxanthellae. And because of this, there are colors to, uh, to corals. When increase the temperature or there is any stress on these uh, algae, these, they die. And because of that, coral starts bleaching. And if this continues for a long time, there is mass bleaching, which is followed by uh, kind of uh, the porous, they stop growing and also stop reproducing. And the in coral leaves, it start increasing. The factor which uh, affects coral leaves is ocean acidification. Because of high concentration of carbon dioxide, uh, the pH of ocean gets lower, and this decrease in pH of ocean it affects the calcification process of all those uh, calcifier animals, marine animals, and coral leaves are very important among them. Uh, in addition to that, sea surface, uh, sea level rise, and also storms and cyclones, they also affect coral leaves. When we come to the blue carbon. Presently, coral leaves are not currently included in the blue because of their carbon releasing process of calcification by sclerotinian corals. See what happens when the calcification process, one carbon is converted into calcium carbonate and one carbon is released as carbon dioxide. Because of this chemical reaction, it is assumed that corals are a carbon source. But it is likely that the carbon released by calcification is consumed in other biological processes on the reef, such as photosynthesis by the associate macrophytes, and they are kept within the system. 
research uh, done uh, suggests that coral reef lockdown significant organic carbon. Like the peptic of reef maximizes the habitat they provide and the crevices and cavities which make up about a one third of the reef. They are significant stores of organic carbon. It is also shown that the high biodiversity of coral reefs means they provide habitat for many organisms which are important in the marine carbon cycle. Uh, for example, fishy macroalgae, coral algae, and sponges, they store enough carbon. Castor's coral algae, for example, they, it covers up to 60% of some reef area. And it is, uh, it is estimated that a significant capacity, capacity exists there to crystal carbon. Uh, so therefore, the cycling of carbon on the coral reef system is a very complex one. Research is needed to, to find out whether uh, coral reefs are a carbon sink or source. But at present, to accept that uh, they are not part of blue carbon budget, but we should not ignore that direct role in conserving other marine ecosystems which are important to preserve reefs of blue carbon. I will stop here. Means we are running short of time, but I will just like to take two or three minutes on mangroves. Uh, it is already covered by in detail by Dr. Ramnathan. My concern yeah. about uh, how soil carbon, organic carbon, is being estimated in mangroves. Uh, I don't know about what, uh, how much uh, sites uh, Dr. Ramnathan have covered. Just about. It. But my concern is about the methodology be, being used by FSI. FSI, Forest Service of India, has made a, a carbon assessment of India's forest where they have covered the mangrove at national level. There I have some apprehension that soil organic carbon, as estimated by Forest Service, Service of India, is kind of underestimation. But for mangrove areas, we need a specialized methodology. The traditional methodology of Forest Service of India will not work in mangrove area as far as soil organic carbon is concerned. And that soil organic carbon as assessed by Forest of India is underestimation. Moreover, FSI has never taken up inventory in Andaman Nicobar Islands, which have got probably the best mangroves in the uh, Mostly free from anthropogenic activities, so I believe that if the correct methodology is adopted, uh, there may be an increase in the soil organic uh, contents in, in uh, mangrove areas. There are methodology on the IUCN website and other websites also, which can be followed. So this is my concern about mangrove. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much for your points. Uh, we appreciate them. I would now request uh, Dr. Priyanka, Research Associate, Land Resources Division, Terry, to present the topic contribution of mangroves, sea grasses, and tidal marshes towards mitigating climate change. And I would have request you to be very brief because we are really running short on time. We also have to take a few questions. So if you can just be very brief. Thank you so much. Thanks, Siddharth. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, as already said, I'll Jenka, there's some problem with your connection. Uh, can yeah. you just switch off your video, please? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, now it's better. Thank you. So uh, the three coastal ecosystems, that is mangroves, tree grasses, and tidal marshes, they are commonly referred to as the blue carbon ecosystems, and which I'll be uh, including in my presentation. So these e coastal ecosystem provides numerous benefits and services that contribute to people's ability to mitigate ad and adapt to the impacts of climate change. And they help uh, by sequestering and storing significant amount of carbons known as the coastal blue carbon from the atmosphere and ocean. And the carbon stored in coastal ecosystem is very extensive and can remain trapped for a very long period of time, thus resulting in large carbon stock. 
So to explicitly address the role of blue carbon ecosystem in uh, climate change mitigation and also human well-being through policy, regulatory, finance, and other mechanisms, the carbon stock in these ecosystems and the existing or potential carbon emissions resulting from changes to those ecosystems must be quantified. And this process is referred to as creating a carbon inventory. So I'll be skipping the basic introduction about the mangroves, uh, seagrasses, and tidal marshes. So this uh, just uh, I'll be focusing on the status of mangrove cover in India from uh, 2003 to 2019. So we can see uh, an increasing trend in the uh, uh, mangrove cover from 2003 to 2019. And now this is a statewide status of mangrove cover as per the ISFR 2019 report. So we can see the total um, uh, mangrove cover was 4975 square kilometer. And it uh, can be seen that there's an increase as well as decrease in some of the states in the uh, mangrove cover. So now coming to sequestration potential of mangroves, uh, a, st a study has been conducted by Terry. So with a total estimated mangrove cover of uh, approximately 4, 000, 4 hectares in 2020, uh, and the value of uh, carbon stock as 386 uh, tons per hectare, the total carbon potential of mangroves was estimated to be around 702 million tons of uh, CO2 equivalent. And the put, uh, it was projected that the potential of carbon sequestration will increase to 748 million tons in 2030. So uh, upon uh, conservation and protection of the mangrove cover, there, there can be an additional sequestration of 207.91 million tons of CO2 equivalent. Now, the valuation of uh, protective services of mangroves. So there was a study uh, conducted by Terry in 2014 in the Sundarban, uh, West Bengal. The mangrove forests have been valued largely for their protective functionings and direct forest dependence for fuel wood and minor forest produce. So the economic value of the storm protective service was observed to be uh, calculated to be around one third of the total cash income of the households and damage cost awarded method was used. So overall, you can see uh, rupees 7,761 per household was calculated to be the uh, economic value. And using this data and the benefit transfer approach, we can do the economic valuation for the entire mangrove cover in India. And then this can be considered as a potential site for implementing carbon finance projects as well as trading uh, carbon in the voluntary market. Now, coming to seagrasses, the total uh, mat area of seagrass in India is 25,378 uh, hectare and with the carbon stock as um, 108 tons per hectare. So the total carbon sequestration potential has been estimated to be around 10.2 million tons of CO2 equivalent. And uh, again, there is uh, using uh, data, previous data, uh, the there, our slide hasn't presented on change detection, so we can see there's a decrease in the uh, uh, seagrass sea cover. Now, coming to tidal marshes, we don't have uh, the um, like uh, the data for tidal marshes has not been surveyed and not mapped, so we don't have a specific value to use and calculate the sequestration potential. So this is a knowledge gap in case of tidal marshes. Now we need to include the coastal. Uh, in achieving the NDC target. So as this point has already been covered by a lot of uh, panelists today, that uh, in order to achieve the NDC target uh, that has been set by the government of India, we need to include the coastal uh, ecosystems uh, in it. And specific motivations for the inclusion of coastal wetlands may vary between countries, and it might include the mitigation benefits, um, the adaptation benefits, NDC progression values, the implementation values, and the carbon finances. Now, uh, based on the study that has been done by knowledge gaps that uh, was uh, seen, first is mangroves are fairly well mapped and large areas containing seagrasses, uh, seagrass meadows have been surveyed, but areas of tidal salt marshes are unsurveyed and undocumented. So we need to focus on that. Notes, uh, data specific for India is available on carbon sequestration and rates of blue carbon ecosystem. And the loss of seagrass, meadows, and tidal marshes are not documented. And then mapping of converted, degraded, and revegetated blue carbon ecosystems and the quantification of emissions from exposed organic soils, um, from disturbed or degraded seagrass meadows, as well as quantification of removals need to be rest restored for the coastal ecosystems. And uh, the relevant database needs to be created for it. 
Now, uh, uh, a short way forward would be the coastal ecosystem has received international uh, attention for its potential mitigation of carbon dioxide emissions. So, with their value for both mitigation and adaptation, uh, the ecosystems are a vital part to any climate change solution. And the government of India must negotiate with UNFCCC for recognizing the carbon sequestered through the coastal ecosystem at national level in achieving the NDC target. And India is lacking uh, the mapping of seagrass, whereas tidal salt marshes. So these two carbon pools need to be surveyed and mapped properly. And the government of India should take measures to conserve the existing mangrove cover and also to increase the mangrove cover, which will lead to an additional sequestration potential of 207.9 million tons of CO2 equivalent. And that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Siddharth. Thank you so much, Priyanka. That was indeed very brief. Uh, but we still have very limited uh, time for question and answer session. Uh, I can see that there are uh, already few questions, but due to paucity of time, we may not be able to take all of them, but definitely our panelists will try and address as many as possible. Uh, so our first question is for uh, Mrs. Uma Devi. Ma'am, uh, so the question is that uh, what factors need to be considered uh, for the ministry uh, for inclusion of blue carbon in achieving NDC target? Is the question clear, ma'am? First, uh, as uh, Priyanka has already mentioned, uh, we do have a lot of data gaps on uh, the blue carbon uh, ecosystems. Whether it is, uh, we are doing very well in, on mangrove front, but yeah, on uh, sea grasses and uh, tidal marshes, there is a lot of uh, data gaps. So, first, uh, and foremost, we need to do the mapping of these areas and also focus on the areas. Mangrove, yeah, she mentioned, FSI has already indicated there is an increase in mangrove cover, and a lot of initiatives have been taken up both by government of India as well as uh, to some extent by the uh, private sector also on mangrove. Okay, thank you, thank you so much, ma'am. Uh, the next question is for Dr. Ramnathan and uh, sir, uh, Dr. Alok Saxena also wish to know from you uh, if there is a specific uh, methodology to estimate carbon from mangroves and uh, uh, you know you worked a lot on that and a lot of other participants have also asked similar questions. So if you can throw some light on that. So basically, uh, uh, the main component is the sediment and the soil carbon. So actually, we do the physical measurements, we do the core sampling. Throughout the world, this methodology is followed. So, and then we determine the rate of accumulation of sediments. And then from that, we estimate that uh, using the proxies and isotopes. But above ground mass, I think people are doing very well. But below ground mass, that is what the maximum storage is there. So that is a well-established methodology we follow using the sediment course. Mm. Okay. Mm. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, so the next question is for Sandeep. Uh, Sandeep, our participants wish to know that just like we have for carbon bonds or like we have tiger bonds, could is there a possibility to have, say, blue carbon bonds specially designed for the shipping industries? Yes, I would. Yes, uh, thanks, uh, Siddharth. Yes, I, I think there is a case uh, for marine bonds. In fact, a few of us are working on that as we speak. Uh, we're trying to see if we can um, somehow combine carbon funding with uh, marine bonds and so on and so forth. And especially for the shipping industry, because a lot of demand for blue carbon that we have currently is from the shipping industry, actually. So, we do see a point. I think in the next 12 months or so, you will see some products out there, some of them that we are working on, some others we're going to collaborate. We have a platform that we are forming as well to try and see how we could, because we, uh, I spoke about the municipal bonds, so it kind of all can tie in to the coastal ecosystem. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Thank you so much. Uh, so our next question is for uh, Dr. Naveen Nambutri. Sir, you worked a lot with uh, coastal communities, so our participants want to know how microfinance uh, can be used for livelihood generation and sort of motivate these uh, communities to conserve uh, the coastal areas. Your thoughts on that, sir? 
Am I able to? Yes, sir. That's a good question because uh, I think uh, the the one of the having worked with coastal communities extensively, one of the issues that we see, particularly with relation to uh, livelihood security, the core and the vulnerability of uh, coastal, especially the fisher communities, is the lack of uh, proper financial management. And I think uh, because it's been a, uh, the practice of fishing itself is so unpredictable that whenever there's a big you know, bumper cash folks tend to just splurge money and then and then later get into debts and stuff like that. The finance management and microfinancing in particular is something that we are uh, seeing. This is also very, uh, you know, women empowerment kind of an exercise as well. It also gives men a certain amount of, you know, independence and freedom. So from a gender perspective as well, it's actually quite a very critical intervention for coastal communities. Yeah. Okay. Okay, thank you so much. So the last question is for Dr. Sharma. Uh, so you've been uh, associated with the ministry for a long time. Uh, so the question is that what gaps do you see in the policy and programs when it comes to a blue carbon economy? Uh, Siddharth, uh, 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 there is a need to have uh, uh, additional uh, technical and financial input as far as uh, uh, conserve blue carbon is concerned particularly the uh, mangroves uh, most important point uh, emerge and i have learned from the discussion today and a series of the And over and above, this is a two time additional word, so it may be more than 4.5 billion ton we have to achieve. So, that we have to take two views. Carbon sequestration is good uh, through a photosynthesis process, we have to do that. But if we if we, if we have the status of the emissions uh, and baseline emissions, if we are able to reduce the emissions, uh, then, then we can also add that uh, that is our achievements towards the nationally determined contributions. Uh, I give you one example that uh, there are 8 crore Ojula beneficiaries are there. If they are refilling and they are using uh, the um, uh, uh, LPG, there is a 90% energy efficiency. And if they are using improved coal stove, there is a 25 to 35% energy efficiency. And through the, uh, um, mangroves, in particular, if we are reducing the emission, even in, uh, maintaining the coral reef, if we are reducing the emissions, that should also be added to the towards the. This point, uh, I say that uh, we have to keep uh, as a part of the. Uh, proceedings if uh, all participants and all uh, panelists will agree that uh, both aspects are good sequestration is good we have to achieve it and also reducing the emission is also good because we are reducing the emissions uh, and uh, the and and the part you have the question exactly you have asked what are the policy yeah. gaps there are multiplicity of the policy regulatory and the institutional mechanism in the country there are many laws are there implemented by different institutions different ministries and all laws and uh, all laws and policies are for the conservation at large and uh, the natural resources at large we have to see how we how these policies and uh, uh, legislations are complementary to each other and benefit you one example that the uh, 73rd amendment uh, we have uh, the uh, gram sabha base means th uh, democratic institution de democratic uh, democratic institution so that in uh, each policy and the each legislation whichever um, they are dealing with uh, we should we should identify the grassroots level as a gram sabha as a uh, institution in forest light act gram sabha institution 
PESA, it is a Gram Samaj institution, but uh, Biological Diversity Act, it is a Gram it, it look, uh, I, I see uh, uh, as far as implementation of the conservation programs through community. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir, uh, for your elaborate answer. So this is the last question, and it's for uh, Dorothy. Uh, so there are, we know that there are a lot of international uh, publications and good uh, reading material available on this topic. So Dorothy, I would request you to share uh, some information with us on the carbon assessment manual, uh, the Blue Carbon Initiative that you've also been a part of. Can you please? There we go. Thank you very much. Yeah, very quickly, I just wanted to mention on the question about the methodology. So there is on the Blue Carbon Initiative website, a carbon blue carbon manual for the three ecosystems. So that's very handy. Of course, there's, as I mentioned, the IPCC guidance on the National Greenhouse Gas Inventories. And then if you go down on the project level related to carbon offsetting, um, there are, of course, the various methodologies in the VCS, the Plan Vivo, um, and so forth. And maybe just, just a final remark also on the point being made um, about looking at these ecosystems um, jointly. You know, is it mitigation, adaptation, et cetera? And as I said in my presentation, there are certain um, accounting profiles that require to put uh, a certain ecosystem in a bucket. But I think when it comes to implementation on the ground and, you know, the um, engagement with the local livelihoods, et cetera, we really ought to look at these systems um, in conjunction because they interact with each other, et cetera. So I really uh, wanted to emphasize that point that was made by a few speakers as well. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much for those points. Uh, they're well taken. Uh, so now I would request Mrs. B. Uh, B. V. Uma Devi, Additional Secretary, MOUSPC, to give concluding remarks. Ma'am, if you can conclude this webinar, please. Yeah. This was a wonderful uh, discussion today. So from this uh, deliberation, we can just uh, uh, I really conclude that there is no doubt that uh, conservation and restoration of coastal systems is one of the effective natural uh, nature-based solutions as uh, these ecosystems, they sequester almost two to four times more carbon than the terrestrial forest. And blue carbon has great opportunity and potential for in mitigating uh, climate change. So uh, uh, as uh, a few of the uh, speakers have mentioned, we need to build capacities in this direction. After identifying the gaps, and um, also we need to involve more and more of uh, the private sector. Uh, and of course, uh, uh, the, uh, one of the speaker from the private sector is I'm not they're doing a wonderful job, but uh, we need to involve more and more of uh, the private sector institution uh, for financing to restore uh, and conserve these coastal ecosystems. As it's just not the responsibility of the government uh, to mitigate the climate change. And uh, also, ecosystem model needs to be adopted rather than just, uh, you know, uh, going, uh, uh, you know, randomly doing some work and planting trees, etc. We need to follow an ecosystem model. Um, then, uh, from social point of view, social aspects point of view, uh, we need to involve local uh, communities in conservation. is It's very important to involve the local communities and uh, providing them with alternative uh, livelihood is very, very, very much essential. Um, blending of, as some of the uh, uh, participants did ask uh, some questions on microfinance. Yeah, we need to blend it with microfinance and uh, with uh, private sector finance as well as the traditional uh, banking arrangement should also be uh, worked out. Um, uh, of course, uh, mangroves uh, are, uh, are very, very important because they involve both uh, above and below biomass and litter. Uh, and uh, they are very, uh, they have very high trapping efficiency. So, uh, and uh, as someone mentioned, we need to develop uh, methodologies to evaluate these uh, carbon which are stored in mangroves. And um, also, we need to identify what are the drivers of degradation of these uh, coastal ecosystems, mainly the mangroves and others. And uh, 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 so, uh, the, another very important. Uh, uh, 
learning from this uh, workshop is that you have beaches and sandy shore management is also very important area. And uh, of course, the recently Bangladesh of India has come up with a project in 10 beaches, uh, it's called the Bean Program, uh, which is a blue flag certification program under the Beach Environmental Project. So these also play a very important role in mitigating uh, climate change. The potential of sign tools is, uh, uh, is also very important. And uh, uh, as someone mentioned, we need to work out and study the planting of these uh, uh, tree uh, plants like Ipomia and Palmera. They also need to be studied. Uh, as uh, uh, Mr. Saxena mentioned, we need to also study what is the role of these coral reefs uh, in, as carbon sinks. Do they have, do they have any role or they just, uh, uh, of course, apart from they, uh, they, they, they play playing an important role in uh, coastal ecosystem indirectly by improving the habitat of other marine uh, organisms. Uh, we also need to work, study on the role, role of coral reefs in as carbon sinks. And of course, uh, 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 there are, as I said earlier, also there are large gaps. In, uh, a lot of work has been done on mangroves uh, by the government as well as uh, other non government organizations. But we need to work more on the seagrasses and tidal marshes. The mapping of these areas needs to be done and focus more on these also so that uh, we improve on the blue carbon front. Thank you. Sorry. Thank you so much, ma'am. Uh, all these valuable and positive insights that you gave us. Uh, it gives a new perspective uh, that should be adopted while uh, carrying forward this work. Uh, we would now like to thank all our eminent panelists for taking out time from their busy schedule. Uh, and for the participants, we'll be sending you all the relevant links after this event, including a link to the webinar recording and also the certificate of participation. Thank you all once again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for giving this address.